stop seeing what love looks like Brighter than the morning light Tender as the sweetest sound Yeah, can turn the tables upside down
Hey, Next Level Church, we have a great way to give love away this Christmas, and I'm excited to tell you about it. Christmas is a great time to invite someone to church because they are more receptive than any other time of the year. This year, we're combining an invitation with giving love away. There are some helpful ideas on our website. Just go to the events page and click on the button, how to invite someone to Christmas. Once on our webpage, you'll see that we have about 15 creative ways that you can use the card to give love away this week. A couple of my personal favorites are handing one to your favorite grocery store clerk. I have a few favorites at my local Harris Teeter. And another one is to suck your neighbor, where you pick a favorite pair of cozy socks, fill it up with a few treats, and slip the invite card inside and leave it on their doorstep. We would love to hear how you gave love away this week. So please tag us on Facebook or Instagram and tell us your story. Good morning. Welcome to Next Level Church and welcome to Next Level Church Online. I'm excited that you have joined us this morning. My name is Joseph McMurray and I'm the teaching pastor here at Next Level Church. One of my favorite Christmas memories from childhood is a story that I love to tell. In fact, you may have heard me tell it before and if you have, you're going to get to hear me tell it again because it was Christmas of 1985. I was in the second Grade And like any typical second grader, I had a Christmas wish list. I'm sure the list was long, but the main item of interest on that list was the Atari 5200. Now, you may have a picture in your mind of what an Atari looks like. And my bet is that you're picturing the one with the wood sides and the joystick with one red button. That was the Atari 2600, which came out years after the Atari 5200. What I wanted was not new. It was a used item that someone was selling in the classified ads in the newspaper. I had my eyes set on it because I knew that it was affordable, it was attainable, and it was something that could be mine. Now, the, the deal in my house was uh, we knew that, that mom and dad were going to let us unwrap a few gifts 
from the parents. Maybe something that my dad had made, like a rubber band gun. Uh, But mostly the things that we would unwrap on Christmas morning were essentials. Socks, underwear, shampoo. We didn't have a lot when I was younger. So at Christmas, my mom would wrap up just about anything so that everyone had lots of gifts to open on Christmas morning. I'm talking about gum, pajamas, stamps. I'm not joking. Oranges, stuff like that. The big presents, though, came from Santa Claus. I'm pretty sure my parents had a deal worked out with Santa Claus because he always brought each of us kids three presents. Usually the first two were eh, just okay. We were grateful. Possibly something on the list, but not necessarily. The third gift, though, that was what Christmas was all about. It was the moment I waited for all year long. Being the curious second grader that I was, I had a tendency to do a little bit of snooping when the opportunity arose. I had figured out that that Santa Claus usually hid my Christmas presents in the top of my mom's closet. And on one snooping adventure, I discovered something that has been burned into my memory since that day. It was the Atari 5200. Now, as I mentioned, it wasn't new in the box. I I didn't care. It was there. And in a few short days, it would be mine. The familiarity of Christmas Eve and and family traditions were almost impossible for me to stand that year. I was was listening, and I was like, yes, uh uh-huh, angels, uh uh-huh, shepherds, yep, virgin, don't really know what that is, don't really want to find out right now. Let's just speed through, sing some Christmas carols, read Twas the Night Before Christmas, milk and cookies, carrot for the reindeer, and can I please just jump in bed and cover my head because I know Santa Claus is coming tonight. And I already know that he's left the Atari 5200 in my mom's closet just for me. When Christmas morning rolled around, we went through the the joy of opening all the other presents first, saving gifts from Santa for last. And the whole time I'm opening underwear and and gum and t-shirts, I've got my eye on the rectangular package with my name on it and the tag that said, from Santa. It seemed like hours of opening bottles of shampoo and and watching my sister open Sweet Valley High books and and my brother open UNC Tar Heel stuff, everything, until it finally was time to open our presents from Santa. When it was finally my turn, I could feel my hands starting to sweat. I could, I could hear my heartbeat pounding in my ears as I ripped open the wrapping paper and opened the box to find, dun, 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 a G.I. Joe toy airplane. <laughs> if you have your Bible with you, I want you to open it to Luke chapter 2. See, familiarity and tradition just seem to go hand in hand with the holidays. And some of us really like it. There are certain things that if they don't happen during our holiday season, it's a huge disappointment. And if something changes and isn't the way we expected it to be, we're disappointed. When it comes to Christmas and and familiarity, uh, when it comes to Christmas, tradition and familiarity are part of the package. For a lot of us, this familiarity come, uh, may come in the form of the Christmas story itself. If I had to guess, I, I would guess that, that this story is, is more familiar to, do, to you than just about any other story in the Scriptures. Even if you have never been to church before, you might know that the story of Christmas is the story of shepherds and and inns and mangers and animals and wise men and, and stars and a pregnant lady on a donkey. There are no surprises. There are no new details in the story from year to year. The story goes how the story has always gone. 
But what if I told you that while the Christmas story we find in Scripture may be common, it is still rich and full of surprises? What if I told you that there's more to the story than what we find in Scripture? Let's look at our story, the the familiar one, the common one, the one we hear every year and most of us could probably recite by heart. And then let's look at something else to help us understand this story even more. If you don't remember anything else I say this morning, I want you to remember this. The Christmas story may be familiar, but it isn't ordinary. The version of the Christmas story most of us know best is found in the book of Luke. Scholars believe that Luke wrote this book around A.D. 59 or 60. That's about 30 years after Jesus died and and rose again. We're going to read Luke chapter 2, verse 1, and then verses 4 through 11, and then verses 13 and 14. It says this, In those days, Caesar Augustus, issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem in the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy. That will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. This is the tried and true Christmas story. This is the one we know. This is the one that feels safe and predictable. And this story ends with a proclamation coming directly from heaven. Luke is the only book we have that that spells out this birth narrative in, in so much detail. While John doesn't give us specific details about the time and place and surrounding circumstances of, of Jesus' birth, The book of John, the gospel of John, does give us an introduction into who Jesus was. He he begins his book this way, John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word. He's referring to Jesus. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him was life. And that life was the light of men. John chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. So there wasn't any mention in the book of John of the nativity, no no shepherds. But John does choose to open the story with a little bit of history. Not with Jesus' birth on earth, but with Jesus' presence since the beginning of the world. Now, this isn't what we're used to reading this time of year. When we think of Christmas, we think of Luke's story. We know how it starts, and we know how it ends, nicely told and neatly wrapped. Maybe the reason Christmas feels so predictable and always looks the same every year is because we've stopped expecting to find something new in the story. I mean, after all, it happened 2,000 years ago, and it is history. History doesn't change, right? How could it be new? But what if we discovered something that made us see Christmas with new eyes? And what if that discovery changed the way we experience Christmas? 
What I'm about to read to you is something that isn't found in Scripture. But it's a picture of what was happening in the rest of the world when Jesus was born. At, a time, at the time of Jesus' birth, the Jewish community was under the control of the Roman Empire. And what we are about to read was found inscribed in stone in an ancient ruin dated from the first century Roman Empire. I'm not going to put this on the screen for you. I just need you to read, to, to listen to the words that I read. It says this. Again, remember, this, was, this is an artifact that was found chiseled in stone dated somewhere around the first century. It says this. The most divine Lord, we should consider equal to the beginning of all things. For when everything was falling into disorder, he restored order once more. And to the whole world, a new aura. Caesar, the common good fortune of all. The beginning of life and vitality. All the cities unanimously adopt the birthday of the divine Caesar as the new beginning of the year. Whereas the providence which has relegated our whole existence has brought our life to the climax of perfection in giving us the emperor Augustus, whom providence filled with the virtue and power for the welfare of mankind, and who being sent to us and our descendants as our Savior, has put an end to war and has set all things in order. Sounds like scripture. It sounds like something you might find in one of the gospels, doesn't it? Take out the the Caesars, And this sounds a lot like the description of Jesus. But here's the thing. This inscription, this this chiseled in stone, wasn't talking explicitly. It, It was talking explicitly about Caesar Augustus, the ruler of the whole Roman Empire. The ruler at the time when Jesus was born. As we've said, what you may have noticed is that as fancy as that language sounds, some of it may also have sounded familiar, as in it sounded a lot like what we read in the book of Luke and what we read in the book of John. The angels in the book of Luke tell us that Jesus is the Savior, but according to the artifact that I just read, Caesar Augustus was the Savior. Luke says Jesus' birth would bring peace on earth, but but we're told here that Caesar Augustus has put an end to all war. John says that the word, Jesus, was in the beginning, and through him all things were made. But what we just read says that the most divine Lord, Caesar Augustus, was to be considered equal to the beginning, and that he brought order. John says that in Jesus was life, and that life was the light for all people. But this ancient inscription says that Caesar Augustus was the beginning of life. What in the world is going on? When we read the story from Luke and the powerful statements that John makes, we start to get an idea that everything about the first Christmas, everything about the arrival of God on earth was unfamiliar. It was new. It was different. The culture they had been living in, the culture that made Caesar a god, the culture that worshipped A man who had incredible power and an incredible influence was a culture that did not have room for another king. But Luke writes to say, we have our Savior. His name is Jesus. We have our Christ. And it isn't Caesar. And don't miss this. The words that were written by Luke 
were fighting words. Luke and John wrote in order to stir things up, as though to say, Caesar thinks he is God. We worship a different God. Caesar thinks he has brought peace. He did it by waging war against anyone who got in his way. Our Savior brings a different kind of peace, a real peace. You you think Caesar was there at the start? It was through our Christ that the world came to be. And this is the gospel that the early Christians spoke of. This was the teaching that eventually got Jesus killed. The first Christmas was all about change. It was all about a change in power, a change in worship, a change in how things had always been done, a change from Caesar to Christ, from supremacy to service, from aggression to peace. The first Christmas was about trying to make the world understand that things weren't always going to be the way they had been. And in the same way, this Christmas can be about change. As Jesus' birth was a direct confrontation of the powers that were in place, so this Christmas can be a challenge to us. A challenge of whatever is taking power and precedence in our lives that shouldn't be. All right, go back with me to 1985. I expected to find in that rectangular box the Atari 5200, which I had spied in my mom's closet before Christmas. But instead, I unwrapped a G.I. Joe toy airplane. It was the Sky Striker F-14, to be exact, which was really cool. In fact, uh, I still have it. I'm not lying. I still have it. My kids have played with it. It lives at my parents' house. One of these days, they're going to kick all of my stuff out of their house, and it's going to have to come to my house. But for now, it's still there. So what about the Atari 5200? I know you're dying to know. Well, how could I ask about it? I couldn't. If I were to say, hey, where's my Atari 5200? I would have completely blown my cover. I I, I would have outed myself as being a snooper. I couldn't ask about it. I just had to let the dream die. On Valentine's Day, the next year, I received the Atari 5200 as a gift. And I didn't ask any questions. I just accepted it and played that thing. And I found out many, many years later, as an adult, that my dad talked Santa out of giving me the Atari for Christmas because we only had one TV in our house. And there were way too many football games on TV between Christmas and New Year's to have to compete with video games. When when Luke and John wrote, they, they wrote not just to tell the story of Jesus' birth, but with the intent of letting those who would read their words know that there was a choice to be made. The question is, what is competing for the place of honor in your life this Christmas? We'll, we'll call it your Caesar. Maybe, maybe every Christmas you get to the point that you allow your frustration at your family to take the attention. Maybe that could be your Caesar. Or, or maybe you've allowed the focus to be on what you want to receive for Christmas or, or what you want to happen by way of traditions. If that's the case, then stuff or the expectation of stuff, or or the expectation of tradition could be your Caesar. Whatever it is, good or bad, if it is at the center, then that means Jesus is not. 
And Christmas is nothing if not the chance to remove the powers that were and put in its place the one that is. Now, sure, we can keep some of our traditions, baking cookies, watching movies, um, opening Christmas presents on Christmas Eve, whatever your tradition is. But when it comes to the heart, when it comes to what has our attention and, and our effort and our focus, let's work this year at, at getting Jesus to be exactly where he should be, at the center of our lives, at the center of our celebrations. See, the Christmas story may be familiar, but it is not ordinary. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the Christmas story. Thank you for the story that we know, for, for the familiar story of, of the virgin birth, of the, of the angels and the shepherds. For the story later on, as we read of the wise men and the gifts and the signs. God, I thank you for the familiarity, but Father, don't let us get caught up in the familiarity that we don't look for the extraordinary. Help us to see that, that Christmas is not just about what we've always known or what we always expect, but there is something new. There's, there's something engaging for us as we look into your word. So Father, as we walk through this Christmas season, I, I pray that you would open our eyes, open our hearts, help us to recognize that, that you are living and active and you are interested in the things that are going on in our lives today. Help us to make Jesus the center of our lives and understand that with you at the center, the other things in our lives get put in their proper place. Thank you for loving us first, God, through Christ. Help us to love you back with our lives. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. No thing can compare. You're our living home. Your presence, Lord. I've tasted. The sweetest of lives Where my heart becomes free And my shame is undone And your presence, Lord Holy Spirit, you are welcome here Come fly
Hey, thanks again for joining us today at Next Level Church, and thanks for joining us here online. Please be sure to to like and and subscribe, and if you would like to join us in supporting the ministries of Next Level Church, we would certainly appreciate your gifts by going to nextlevelchurch.org slash give. You can select one of the options there and know that whatever you give to Next Level Church will be used to raise the reputation of Jesus where we live, work, and play. And now as you go, may Jesus hold the place of honor in your life this Christmas season. And may you experience the peace and the hope and joy that only he can offer. Amen.